yourself um, before you ask so that we, we have full documentation during this. Um, cool? Cool. Please. Uh, so yeah, I'm Chris Hagan, I'm a data reporter at WBZ. Um, and we were hoping to kind of just take you through real quick kind of how we use data visualization in our work. Um, obviously, I don't say the word visualization very often because I just mangled it. Um, but let me take you through, I wanted to, to talk about a project uh, that we did at BUZ recently. Um, is there a microphone? I don't know, is there a microphone? Is this a microphone? Carly, <laughs> Carly, like a is this a microphone? It is. Is this right? Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Chris Hagen. I'm the Did data reporter at Google. Um, and in, in that role, um, I write stories around data, and then also help um, other reporters at BEZ use data in their stories. And it's kind of in that role I want to talk about a project that we did recently around neighborhood schools in Chicago. Um, and it's a, a <coughs> sorry, that again? There we go. Um, so one of the main things when you're doing, when you're working with data and working with visualizations is you need to, I mean, the key is to understand the issue that you're gonna talk about. And for us, um, this story was something that our education reporter, Linda Letton, had been following for a very long time about some changes in the way that um, elementary schools worked in Chicago. Um, so that there were, the, the rules about attending the neighborhood schools had relaxed. There were more charter schools, more uh, selective schools, and we wanted to see if that had changed um, how kids went to school um, in Chicago. And so what questions did we have? So for, for us, the main thing was um, how many neighborhood, how many kids are attending their neighborhood school? And the answer to these questions um, kind of uh, in, influenced the way we wanted to visualize the story. Um, so in this case, did we want to look broadly at just the way the city is run, um, just the trends of the city, or did we want to look uh, more selectively at individual schools or individual neighborhoods? Um, we wanted to look at how this was going to change over time, and so in that case, did we want to add a uh, motion to the graphic so you could see how things progress? Did we want to do things in more of a line graph where you can kind of see how things changed over time? Um, and the other thing was geographically, our different neighborhoods affected differently by this problem. And in that case, do we need to use a map or some other geographic visualization? And then a very, very key thing when you're doing a data visualization is to think about who your audience is gonna be. Because that changes the information you need to show, how you show that information. And for us, one of the key things was uh, parents and families who are in CPS. Um, and because of that, that meant that the school that that kid attended was a very emotional connection for a large part of our audience. And so that meant that being able to drill down into the visualization was gonna be very important for us. Um, Chicago residents, people who, you know, taxpayers in Chicago who maybe don't have a kid uh, in CPS but did want to find out about this, this meant that the, the large, the broad city trends were important. Um, and then just education advocates in general. Um, people who are, you know, maybe not connected to CPS, maybe not necessarily part of Chicago community, but are interested in education, especially how it could affect their community. And so those, having those people in mind can kind of change the way you think about how you want to visualize something. And so our, our plan was to have a map of the city with every school represented by a dot. Um, and then we would change the color of that dot based on the percentage of neighborhood kids who attended that school. Um, we would animate that change year over year so you could see the trend, but then we'd also allow you to search and zoom in on the map so that people who are interested in a specific school could find that information. And so we had a ton of data. There are 600, more than 600 schools in CPS. We had data for 14 years of the uh, number of kids who attended the school, whether they were in the neighborhood, how many kids lived in that neighborhood. Um, and so we had nearly 8,000 individual data points um, from all of these variables that we had to track. Um, so we had to first really understand the data. And I mean, that's the key thing. You can use a lot of free tools, um, get some, you know, some data from Excel or something like that and come up with a really cool looking visualization, but if you don't understand the data you have, then that visualization is still worthless. So we had to do a lot to make sure that we understood the data that we had. 
so we had to clean it. Um, data from CPS can be very, very dirty. And, and in this case, um, there were a lot of things, a lot of moving parts. So we had a lot of percentages. We were trying to track what percentage of kids were doing something. So we had to check our math. Um, I use a program called R to do that, but you can easily do something in Excel or in a free program like Google Spreadsheets. Um, I had to reformat the data to make sure it fit the type of visualization we wanted to do. Um, I use uh, Python and a, um, a package called uh, Pandas. Um, but there's an open tool from Google called OpenRefine that you can use to uh, clean data really easily. Um, and then another important thing is I did a lot of exploratory visualizations. These are things that you're not going to necessarily present to the public or to your stakeholders, but will help inform what you're going to make. Um, so I made that. Um, this never made it to the public. You guys are the first people outside of BUZ to see this. Um, this is something I made in a JavaScript printer called B3, and it just graphed the, uh, the data for every single school. And this way we could look really real quickly and see if there is any anomalies, if there was a year missing, or if there's a certain school that dropped off and that we want to investigate more. Um, but this was something that, that no one else ever saw. We just used internally to kind of check whether our data was clean and if there was a story we wanted to follow. Um, so we we're going to make our map. Um, I used a free program called QGIS to kind of do the first look and to geocode the, uh, the school. Um, and then I used a, another free program called Leaflet to do the, um, the base map that we ended up using. Uh, there's a design company called Stamen that has a lot of free map tiles that are really, really um, beautiful and easy and free to use. Um, and then I used V3 again to do this, the, the school circles and the animation. Um, and this is what it looked like at first. Um, not really pretty, kind of looks like Chicago, but um, not exactly what we were going for. So we needed to clean it some more. Uh, we found out that a lot of the school addresses were wrong. Schools move all the time in Chicago. They are constantly changing names and addresses, and so we had to clean all that up again. Um, and so we set up a Google spreadsheet, something real simple and free, so that uh, myself, Linda Letton, and then our other education reporter, Becky Beebe, could go through and check and track issues. Um, and we had <coughs> almost 200 separate issues that we had to fix in the data from either missing numbers or schools in the wrong place. Um, but by building the map and then working together on the spreadsheet, we were able to do that. And so our last steps, and these are some other free tools that we use a lot, we wanted to highlight a couple of things. And so we used um, a, a tool called Data Wrapper. Um, it's a free website for putting together uh, data visualizations. It just takes in copy and paste from Excel, and you can get tables or charts. Um, we used to put together a couple of uh, tables um, to highlight some of the larger findings of citywide trends. Um, and then we used another free uh, program called Data Tables, which is you'd have to do a little bit of coding for that, but you can get free formatted searchable um, tables in a web page. Um, and then we used Twitter Bootstrap to display everything. It's a um, free web framework that Twitter put together. It's uh, responsive, and you can use it to put together websites really, really quickly and easily. Um, and that was what we used to display the final thing, which looked like this. Um, <coughs> this is the working version of it. And so you can start in 2001 and then see how the schools change to 2014. Um, these all show different things that, uh, or different schools. The red ones are um, charter schools or um, schools that draw from the whole city, and then green ones are neighborhood schools. So you can kind of see how that changed <coughs> over the years. Um, we were really happy with how this turned out. This actually ended up informing some of our reporting. We took this uh, graphic to some of our sources and showed them and had them react to it. Um, and actually had some of those reactions in the story. <coughs> um, and so that's the, the URL if you wanted to go and check it out and visit it yourself. Um, and this is, yeah, just kind of a I wanted to walk through kind of our thought process because I think that's the most important thing to take away from this is not any individual tool or type of chart to use because those will change all the time. The kind of the important
important thing is the thought process and how you approach your project, because um, that's something that you can take to any sort of project or any sort of visualization. And that is my info. If you wanted to get in touch, um, I always love to hear what people have to say, or if you guys just want to follow me on Twitter and I can follow you back, that would be fine. Um, but yeah, that is that is my spiel. I guess, did anybody have any questions? I, I realized I kind of went pretty fast. Yes. Uh, do you archive uh, map platforms like uh, uh, CPS schools and stuff like that so you're not starting from scratch all the time? You you build on a uh, existing template for uh, continuous map stories? Um, so we actually started um, something like that with this project. I actually just started at BEZ in February, so I didn't have a huge um, database to draw on. But um, we got all of this data from a number of sources. We got the official CPS. We used some data from school cuts. Um, we used um, data that Linda Ledden had put together when school, the school closures happened. Um, and also just Google and LexisNexis sources. But now we do have that um, base that we're going to use in future CPS projects going forward. Is that platform being considered to be made available sort of like open source that other people could add their yeah, we're, data we're on top of it? we're cleaning it up a little bit more. Because it's uh, it's still pretty dirty from what <laughs> what we put together. Yeah. How long did it take start to finish uh, to produce that map that you showed us? Um, I, it, I think the the whole project took about a month, um, but I, I wasn't working on that full time. I mean, um, I think I've just adding up the hours probably about a week to get it all. But the the main part was the data cleaning. The map came together pretty quick. The data behind it took a long time. Did you have to FOIA every school to get zip codes or something, or? Um, you mean just for the geographic? Just for the basic data that you started with. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, Linda FOIA'd that information from CPS, the, yeah. Uh, is there a standard map projection that these free tools use? Um, it's, I'm trying to remember what the, do you have that? Is it WGS V4 or? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Four three two six, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so like all my assets are state plane. State plane. <laughs> Illinois state plane east feet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. No, uh, that took a long time too. Was project reprojecting mm -hmm. the CPS maps from the Illinois state plane back into yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, sorry. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, I'm Becky. I work at an organization called Curse Monthly Films. Um, before I start, can I actually do a quick survey of you guys? How many people here work at nonprofits? Oh, good. Okay. How many um, of those nonprofits work at nonprofits with a staff less than 25? Great. Okay. We're gonna have fun. <laughs> um, okay. So, Cartoon Queen Films. Um, for those of you that haven't heard of it, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit social issue documentary film production organization. Um, and we also run a number of film service programs. So my job specifically is working with our different producers um, to help them create audience engagement, outreach, and impact campaigns um, that go along with the exhibition of their documentary. That's half of what I do. The other half of what I do is um, run all of our programs. So um, we have grant-funded uh, filmmaker, emerging filmmaker programs. The thing about both of those jobs that are related to data is that they're both um, managed to outcomes. Um, everything that I'm doing is managing to outcomes as far as working with data. So for those of you that are in nonprofits and working with grants, um, I'm constantly trying to find ways to collect data and visualize data for grant reports, um, board reports, um, and then writing new grant applications. As far as the outreach side of what I do, um, we're always working on data visualization for um, marketing the films and then also talking about how we are using the films to create an impact and both why that's important and why the social change needs to happen and then 
why what we're actually doing and um, the film, how the films are actually helping to create some of that change. So I wrote down 10 quick thoughts that I had about data visualization. Um, so bear with me, some of them are more obvious than others. Um, a lot of what I do is talk to artists and filmmakers about data and data visualization. So when that happens, a lot of times artists and filmmakers sort of clam up when you start using the word data or metrics or information um, systems. So we try to bring, break it down and make it as simple as possible. Um, our thought process is really like distill as everything down to the most bare bones ideas that you can get it and still create um, a, picture, a picture or a succinct idea um, and do that in your data visual visualization. Number two is it's okay to show people um, what they already know. So essentially someone, when we're talking about data visualization as far as um, marketing and board reports, um, they're not gonna spend a lot of time looking at this information. So um, you can illustrate something that you are talking about. This may not work with everyone, everyone may not agree with this, but this is, some, this is a way that I talk to people who aren't necessarily data friendly um, about collecting data. Um, Interactivity doesn't necessarily mean the data visualization itself has to be more than static, meaning you can have a static data visualization and that can still provoke interactivity on the part of your audience. Um, know the place for data visualization in your organization or your program. So sometimes data visualization can really work well to enhance what you're trying to achieve. Other places it might not be the best tool. Um, be really discerning about where you're deciding to use data visualization and how you're deciding to use that. Um, think about how you'll be organizing data before you create surveys. Why are you collecting information? Which is really, really important. I often work with filmmakers and programs to create um, evaluation forms. When you are creating evaluation forms, the one thing I really want to drive home is that you should be thinking about how you're going to be using um, that information that you're collecting. What's the point of collecting it? Are you asking people to give you the same information more than once in your surveys and in your evaluations. Um, and I often try to think about how I'm going to actually reduce the information before I even start asking for the information. So what am I gonna make it look like so that it's simple and understandable before I start asking people to fill out multiple choice or um, demographic information? Don't necessarily always collect more data than you need. Sometimes if you're working on a big project, um, it can become really, really overwhelming and that can actually act as a barrier rather than something to help move you forward. So make sure that you um, are really also discerning in deciding what data you want to collect. Use the easiest <laughs> data aggregator for your purpose. So there are so many, like Chris said, data aggregators and also um, systems and open source tools that you can be using. You don't necessarily always have to like get a new graphic design degree if you want to start working in data visualization. You can use something that's easy and works for you. If you know Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel, explore Microsoft Publisher and the Excel graph making program. Start with what you know, encourage the people around you to start with what you know, and then build up from there. Um, which goes into my another point, don't disregard simple tools. Um, if you use Google Docs, you may be able to easily migrate over into Google Graphs, and that can be something manageable and a way into your data visualization um, part of journey, I guess. <laughs> Learn to interweave data with a narrative. So this is something that um, some people do really, really well and other people just need to practice. Um, how do you talk about data and use statistics um, in a conversation? Um, that's part of what we do in our films and that's part of what we try to talk to our filmmakers and our producers about how to um, you know, interweave some of the research that they have done in their daily conversations. Um, and then the last point is expand your concept of data to include story. So a lot of the information that we are working with in my organization is um, comments, stories, not necessarily numbers or statistics, but actual um, ideas, concepts, Facebook comments, tweets, um, that is all considered data from where I come from. I know that there are some people <coughs> who might disagree with me on that, but we do consider um, you know, tweets, sentences, ideas, um, data as well. I'm 
going to show you guys a couple examples of how we've used data visualization um, in different ways through our organization. So we produced the film, The Interrupters. Um, it's a documentary about uh, an organization in Chicago that tries to interrupt violence on the street while it's happening. Um, this is a still frame from a website that we created, which was an interactive um, outreach campaign website tool. Um, this is part of it, so we're integrating both video clips, um, those little like play signs that for you can actually click on that video and hit play, um, images, and then graphs with um, data information about violence in Chicago at the bottom. Um, this is an impact report that we had created for the interrupters. Um, the Interrupters was nominated for an impact award for the social change that it helped uh, create. And so part of what we're doing here is this really simple graphing of, of information that we could otherwise write in a narrative form, um, but maybe more effective if we used a visualization tool. So on the left is a really simple timeline about um, who saw the film and how many viewers and eyeballs we actually were able to achieve to watch that. And then on the right, is um, online trends through Twitter um, that show when the name of the film, uh, the purple is when the film title was tweeted out and then the white is the name of the organization um, that we were working with and how those um, correspond and correlate. I have a question. Yeah. So what are some of the tools that you use to collect that data? We use a number of different tools to collect that data. Um, obviously, Twitter, um, we're using the analytics through Twitter itself, and we use Hootsuite a lot. Um, and then we use Google, um, Google Docs and Excel spreadsheets. Um, <coughs> we don't have a lot of resources. There are about 12 of us on staff. Um, so we do the best that we can with uh, free and open source software. Um, and then honestly, the Who's Thought parts, we do all survey. Um, so we survey audiences at our screenings. We try and get numbers from box office or festivals or whoever's managing um, the location that we're screening the films at. And then um, we usually integrate um, reporting on the website as well. So if you um, have seen the film either through the broadcast on television or through a festival or through a community screening, um, there's usually a way to go back to the website and fill out a survey or give us your feedback that way. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. This is another page from the impact report um, that is just basically timeline oriented way to organize um, visual data, or I'm sorry, visualize uh, data rather. All right, the next thing I'm gonna show you is some examples of like how we're using data visualization in some of our marketing and social media. So really simple, people don't, um, you know, we see this every day on like BuzzFeed <coughs> and Facebook, um, taking an image and then putting a fact or a piece of data next to it. Um, it's one of the easiest things to create as a nonprofit. It doesn't take a lot of time or a lot of work, and it's incredibly powerful and effective to link um, an image with just a sentence or a fact. Um, and then the bottom is graphs that we would put on Facebook um, that have to do with our film. So finding other tools and other pieces of visualized data that we're just repurposing. Sometimes people don't think about that, even though it's the most obvious thing in the world. Here are some examples of some outreach cards and impact cards that we hand out um, using data in a different way. Um, and then I'm going to go back and talk about the survey thing again. Um, we are collecting most of our own data ourselves. We survey all of our different program participants. Um, and we survey our, as much audience as we possibly can to get um, feedback, so we're constantly sourcing feedback. Um, so on the left side of the screen is an example from one of our recent films at, um, that just premiered at the James Hispel Film Center, um, a very brief audience survey to do that. Um, we're advocates for the simpler, the better, um, the easiest that you can make the survey to complete, um, the better you're doing. We didn't even want pencils involved, so we just had like them tear the sides of the answer. Um, and then a lot of thought went into how we were gonna create this survey and what questions we wanted to ask and what we were gonna do with those questions. And this is part of what came out of that survey, a really, really very simple visualized infographic of um, the information that we collected from the number, first number of screenings. 
um, and then we put that out on social media <coughs> to try and raise awareness about what we were doing and also um, get people more engaged with the film. Yes? How many tools did you service? That's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head. 90% at this point, please. Yes. Um, that's a really good question. I'll find out. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you guys are just a couple of examples of open source tools that we use to um, help aggregate and organize information. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Night Lab, their open, open source stuff. We do, um, his, we're working on a historical timeline, uh, which is just organizing data for our internal organization. This is a prototype, so it's not done. Um, our 50 year anniversary is coming up in 2016. So we're working right now on creating um, a timeline of the history of the organization with the Night Lab um, timeline software. A tool that I often advise um, our outreach coordinators and our producers to use um, is Sparkwise. I don't know how many of you have used Sparkwise or heard of it. Um, it aggregates social media information in a dashboard that you can then organize, um, control, contribute yourself so you can input your own information and data in there. Um, it's a great way to um, have some sort of digital, visual di digitalization, or <laughs> excuse me, visualization of data done for you, and then it's a great um, like report that you can then give out to um, funders, board members, anyone interested in um, all that information about your social media outreach campaign. Um, the last couple of things I'm gonna talk about are different ways that we um, use data in our films. So our films, uh, right now we have 18 films in production, um, six are coming out this year. Um, or have recently just been released. Um, we are known for character-driven stories, um, which means that we normally follow uh, one, two, or three characters very closely um, over the course of some period of time. Um, and on the surface, when you watch the film, um, there may not be like transparent or obvious data necessarily through a narrative or a graphic. Um, that being said, the films are, are, are all highly researched um, and there's a lot of information and data collecting that goes into um, the reasons behind that we create the narrative the way that we do. Uh, we do have one film coming out. These, uh, this film isn't out yet. It's a six part series um, that we are creating uh, commissioned by Al Jazeera America on low wage workers in the United States. So uh, these are prototypes again about some examples of how we're using digital visual, uh, data visualization on images to um, really simply drive home some ideas that we're talking about through the narrative and through the story of the characters themselves. Very simple graphs. Um, again, like general three second rule, we don't expect anyone to be looking at this for more than three seconds, so we want it to say something very clear, um, very powerfully. This one, I don't know if you guys can read that, it says only 39% of student loan borrowers are paying down their balance. So um, some of the themes that are coming up in the film are student loans, um, credit card debt versus student loan debt in the general United States economy, um, income like for low wage workers, and then uh, commute time and how that, inter uh, how that relates to wage and socioeconomic status. Um, and then finally, young adults living with parents, which ties in with um, student loans, and sort of the debt crisis in America and what's happening with uh, family structure. Yeah. So you do, <coughs> so you do a lot of data crunching um, to produce a good film or to have data behind the stories that you're telling. Then, but you don't use the data necessarily in the final product in the film. I wouldn't say that, but I I would say that we may not be um, as journalistic about the way that we use data in the final films. Um, we try to integrate it with the narrative and the story versus necessarily um, having a voiceover narrator just read out facts. Um, does that answer your question? I think so. so. So I think you're saying that in the final film, you would hear someone talk about data, for example, or, but it, but it, it also sounded like you have websites and other places right, where yeah. you do a deeper exactly. dive into the full Exactly, okay. yeah, that's exactly what we do. Okay. Yes, yes. How are you? How are you funded to do what you do? 
Uh, mostly grant funds. So the grants provide you to fund it and then you choose the projects? Um, it honestly depends on the project, but um, generally, uh, so the films that we have, it'll ha it, the filmmaker will come to us with an idea for a film or they'll have already started making a film and then um, we do a lot of research about appropriate grants for them to apply to with that um, film idea and then that's how they raise money for the films. The programs generally um, we are, we have been developed based on a need in the community for services um, that we're trying to fill. So we uh, survey the community or just are aware of needs in the community and then create programs based on how we can see ourselves strategically fitting and filling some of those needs. So some of the programs that I manage are a rough cut screening program for independent filmmakers um, so they can come and get feedback from our established producers on uh, the films that they're working on. Um, I run an internship program that trains college age students um, for uh, in documentary filmmaking and also just social issue media arts. Um, we have a four to six percent acceptance rate in our internship program. Um, and I think this last term, to give you an idea of some data that I collect, we received <coughs> applications from 36 schools across 10 countries. Oh, I'm sorry, 36 schools across four states, or four countries and 10 states is what it was. Uh, and then we also run a diversity fellowship program that's a cohort workshop based um, to help increase the number of diverse filmmakers in the field. Um, so as far as reporting on programs, I wanted to show you guys a couple examples of that. That is something that I'm working on right now at Cartunguin. Uh, the examples I have are from another organization. Um, so here are some ways to um, continue to visualize just really basic survey data um, as far as like an annual report or a um, board report or even a grant report um, based on program data. So a lot of times um, grants will require you to talk about what you're going to report on during the grant application um, and then it's always good to be thinking about how you're going to actually find that information and how you can make it engaging for the grant funders also. So here are some examples of that. Um, the last thing I'm going to show you guys are some things that I use to think about um, how I am going to use data to be able to then eventually visualize it and how I manage data um, to outcomes. I recently read a book um, called Leap of Reason about managing to outcomes. Um, think of, you know, and it talks about thinking of each outcome as what you have to manage towards. Um, you know, prioritize the top two or three measures to track, to stay focused on what really matters. Um, <coughs> think about, you know, what you want to know versus what's the easiest thing to know and try to survey based off of that. So that is my presentation. Um, right now, that is correct. Yes. Hi there. Um, I'm really interested and excited to see that you have a partnership with Al Jazeera. That's awesome. Um, for anyone who doesn't read Al Jazeera, give it a shot. Um, how'd you get it? <laughs> um, Al Jazeera came to one of our filmmakers and pitched a series. And that filmmaker came to the organization and said that he wanted the organization to work on that series. Awesome. I think I would say that we got it based off of 48 years of ethical <laughs> storytelling. Wasn't it, wasn't it, weren't they like sourcing other? Honestly, I'm not sure. Yeah. That I was before I joined this I time. Were, so. I think they were. Um, they were pitching a lot of independent organizations. You know, independent. Carly knows more than I do. <laughs> Should I go back there?
Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, uh, did you guys have any other I would love to know, yeah, how yeah. you guys use data visualization because I'm still learning myself, so. Yeah, uh, so I worked with Gary, Indiana, um, PD, and uh, one of the things we did was um, take a look at their abandoned buildings that were in the city, and when we first started working with them, um, they didn't have any data on which homes were abandoned, which ones were in good condition, which ones were in poor condition, and anywhere in between. So it's really difficult to plan for redevelopment of the city unless you know sort of where your houses are, where your strong neighborhoods are. And we talked to Detroit, these folks at Data Tourism Detroit, and they had conducted uh, the Detroit Residential Parcel Survey where they had a paper survey, answered questions about each of the homes, and then collected and had sort of this visual representation of the neighborhoods. And um, a guy who had worked with that offered to build us a phone, a mobile phone app. So what we do now is have these volunteer days where we have folks come out, they bring their mobile phones, we go up and down the streets of Gary, every single house. Is it abandoned? Is there a structure there? What grade would you give it? There's a grading rubric. And what we've been able to do from that is get a really good picture of the city and map out where are your blocks that have A homes, where are your strong communities? You can target your F houses then in those communities so that blight doesn't spread. So that's one of the ways that um, the Paris Goal has been using it. Are you using that in conjunction with census data? With census data? No, not with census data. We were able to get parcel information for that. I mean, we have the census data on sort of the statistics of Gary, but yeah. Wow. It's pretty neat. That's really neat. Are you integrating stories at all from the community in your research? Uh, in the research, where there's sort of like anecdotal, you know, experiences when you go out and you talk to folks, people in the neighborhood obviously know the neighborhood best and are great resources of information. Um, but as far as beyond that, mapping, I mean, we tell stories when we write our grants mm -hmm. <laughs> for funding, um, mm -hmm. which have been successful. But yeah, sure. there seems like there's a lot more ways to kind of try to direct things ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, my name is Camille Cassidy. I work at the Institute for Housing Studies at DePaul. Hi. And one of the things, uh, I work in communications there, and we produce these big reports. And one of the uh, statistics I've seen over the last year is that nobody downloads PDFs. Right? But a lot of organizations who do have the resources to still hire designers and it's, it's very expensive. And all of our research comes with you know, vi visualizations that we don't want to disappear. Mm -hmm. right? I think that there is a feeling among um, some people that if you don't have a PDF, you don't have a report. It's not real, right? The web will go away. The, somehow this will disappear. So I mean, I guess from, from both of your perspectives, how do you deal, or anybody else, how do you deal with that, like, kind of, if you invest a lot of money into research or a project, you want it to be there forever, but there's this feeling that whatever you put, whether it be a map or a portal, isn't solid, isn't permanent. You can't print it out, you know, flip through it, it doesn't have page numbers. I, I just wonder about other people's experience with that. Um, well, and then that's been a huge topic in the data journalism community is how do you archive a big project? And a lot of um, like the big projects from the early years of data visual or, um, data journalism, which was really not that long ago, are starting to disappear because um, as Google changes um, their APIs or things like that, things fall off. Um, so yeah, and um, I've also uh, before this I worked um, in um, uh, in marketing at a university. Uh, in Oregon, so I've, I've, I've been it from both sides. Um, and there is, yeah, there are certain stakeholders who always want something physical. Um, I've, I worked in newspapers for a number of years where almost everything we did was physical. Um, so there, you're always gonna have people who want that. Um, but I, I think if, for like the project that we did, um, we have that set up where it will live in that space. I mean, as long as our servers keep running, we have the libraries that are based on, archived on our, on our servers. Um, so, and the other thing is that we're using free and open source stuff. And so it's stuff that we have. We're not asking Google or anyone else for anything. So that's one of the ways that you can make sure, is as long as you control each step of it, it's easier to archive. Um, but I think that's still, yeah, definitely a great question and still an open question. Well, because you have the alternative of spending several thousand dollars designing a PDF that, mm -hmm. that your stakeholders, the people who are most important, your funders, um, also people who are very important, appreciate, but then the general public, you know, the feeling is, is that no one's going to no look at your 35-page document. 
Well, I mean, and I'll say as a reporter who often reads a lot of reports from nonprofits, like I would much rather have it in a website than right. a PDF. I hate reading PDFs; they're awful. Right. But and that's the same. Right? Yeah. yeah, I will say. I mean, especially when I was working, yeah, at the university, we had stakeholders, especially people who were funding the college, who wanted a PDF. And so I think it goes back to like what we we're talking about with audience. Mm -hmm. Like you have to know who you're talking to, and even if you know the majority of your audience doesn't want a PDF, if you know the most important part of your audience does, then. Um, there's still a reason for it, but you're right, there is that limited resources, like do we want to put all that into this one format? And I guess the some of the answer is to try to figure out ways that you can use both. Um, some of the screen grabs of my maps have been, and we, they're, they're high enough res that they've been used in textbooks and things like that. Um, so if you can find something that could be cross-platform, that's, you know, that you can use in both places, that can save a little bit of time and effort. There was one. Yeah. I have a yeah. question. Um, my name is Josh Fox. I work with Project Exploration. We're a nonprofit that does uh, science education with kids. And I'm kind of on the side of, of development and fundraising, so thinking about what funders want to see. But then I've also got involved in our database and, and data collection and evaluation. So I'm curious, especially Becky and Chris, if you have any ideas from any feedback or thoughts from a funder perspective about ways that using visualization with data you know helps them understand what what you're doing better or helps solidify that relationship or just helps make your case better uh, I think that my answer to that would be each funder expects something different number one and so like I'm sure you already do, know your funder um, and know what they want. And then if I were going through that process, you know, data visualization can also be used internally to help you progress your report or your um, application. So if I'm doing like an online grant report and it has to be, or I'm sorry, an online grant application, it has to be 2,000 characters exactly, and I can't use the data visualization technique, what I might do is um, do a data visualization for myself to just like graph out or organize the information in my own head or on paper to then write about it clearer and more concisely in the um, grant application. As far as, you know, making your case or proving that your programs are effective, um, it's going to depend on the funder. But internally, as uh, an organization and the information that you're sharing with your staff, um, I think it's really important to keep everyone on the same page. And it's easy. It's an easy way to share a lot of information very simply. Yeah, I mean, I would echo that. I mean, it's like I said, it's about knowing what, knowing your data, understanding it, and then understanding the stories it can tell, and then knowing your audience and your goals, mm -hmm. and the best way to, I mean, to kind of present that information. The good thing I would add to that is uh, when you want to communicate with funders, you don't necessarily have to just always do it in the context of the, you know, the, the linear report structure exactly. that they want. Sure, you have to continue to do that, but I would venture to say that most funders would be intrigued, if not uh, appreciative, of <coughs> seeing some sort of data visualization of the impact that their program is happen that, that they're <coughs> having. Certainly that's something uh, all donors are interested in and integrate that into stewardship plans or newsletters. So I wouldn't limit uh, creativity as it relates to data visualization just to reporting requirements, but rather what's the story mm -hmm. that you wanna share about the impact that you're creating. Yeah, and story is really important and sometimes left out of conversations about data. And that's something that I'm always trying to get people to think about is how can you integrate story and data together to make a more powerful, comprehensive um, concept, whether it's a report or uh, a film or a website. Um, how can you talk about numbers and statistics and then also seamlessly um, bring in quotes or stories or images um, to enhance that? And then the other thing I would say is, like you're talking about, it's not just sharing that data specifically with the funder. I know I am you know, don't be afraid to share that data and that story out in the wider um, public. Because, you know, if you create a great visualization that gets, you know, 5,000 shares on Facebook, that's a great story to take back to someone too. 
I think that uh, this, this storytelling is really critically important for what we're all doing. Uh, uh, the potential to have our youth involved, uh, creating stories, uh, uh, telling uh, what the problems are in our neighborhoods, uh, what the challenges are of our schools and our programs, and, and, and uh, educating donors so we increase the number of people supporting what we do. Uh, it's a win-win. It, it, it's just finding ways that we're uh, uh, get, creating those stories in more places and more frequently uh, with a common goal. So have you guys had any um, particular successes with data visualization that you guys have done within your organizations that you've, you've liked that you'd want to share? How are you doing that? Through a uh, platform on, uh, it's a, an app called DonorFest. And so it uh, pulls in donation data through whatever kind of storage a uh, nonprofit keeps that, whether it's a CRM database, a spreadsheet, even posting notes, uh, to, to come into the platform and then visualize a variety of different uh, fundraising metrics. And so they can uh, not only communicate that, but use that to focus their time and resources on greatest opportunities and, and really see the impact. Are you working with the nonprofit leaders to identify those metrics also? How, how are those? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. That's actually part of the platform is when uh, organizations enroll, they're matched with a fundraising coach or mm -hmm. professional um, who has worked with organizations just like theirs through virtual meeting sessions to be able to answer questions like that and mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the, from my experience, one of the biggest challenges um, is understanding and identifying your metrics um, and being able to do that in a way that can aid the visualization process. Um, and I think it just requires a lot of forethought and also the understanding that metrics can change over time, which I'm constantly reminding myself of. So I'm gonna remind everyone else of that. Of course. 
So that's the platform that's available to use to communicate this information with the public. And a lot of what we did trying to figure that out was go and talk to the different departments, figure out the service delivery indicators, and then have to kind of turn around to Socrata and be like, can you put in a line so that regular people can understand if like the bar is below the line, it's bad, and above <laughs> the line, it's better? And I bring that up only to say that I think that it's really, really important to lead with the context of what you're trying to communicate to your audience. And I think it's great that you guys have such a strong focus on what are you trying to do. The most complicated thing is not always the best thing. Because like, what, most people, they're like, oh, it's under the line, it's over the line. I get it. Um, <laughs> anyway, that was an anecdote. <laughs> I would I mean, echo that, and I think yeah. Yeah, Becky had said that before, like distill and simplify everything. Um, like the, the map we ended up producing looked very, very complicated, but it could have been a lot more complicated. There were versions <laughs> of this map where there were like three or four different circles inside of each other, and they were all different colors, and we had to, to step back and realize like, what is the like one important thing we want this to show? And it was that, just basically that over time, there are fewer kids in a neighborhood school. And we felt that our final product did that. When you looked at 2001 and 2014, there was one thing that you saw that was very, very important. And I think that's the key to understand, yeah, not only who you're producing um, the work for, but what your what your data says, and what is the, like the one important thing you want someone to get out of this. I mean, like Becky said, like in 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 the films, you have three seconds, and that's basically the same wherever anyone's looking at this. Mm -hmm. When they look at a chart, you probably have three seconds to get their attention. They may look at it again, but you have that three seconds to grab them and bring them in. And so if you can show them one fantastic thing in those three seconds, that's so much better than having something that if they spend an hour with, they could learn you know, all the context of the story. And, and I, just really quick, I, I said that in context of data visualization, right? So have something mm -hmm. that can communicate an idea in three seconds, three to five seconds, I'll be generous. Um, obviously, the research and the understanding and the story can go a lot deeper than that. But um, if you're using infographics and data visualization, like be able to do, be able to convey and communicate that idea and that concept in three seconds. Sorry. Well, I'm Madonna. I'm with the Hood Foundation. This is a nonprofit that I started, uh, which was it started from a, um, a art program that I was doing with uh, inner city youth, and I was trying to find a way to collect data to get children to participate in an art project, but to collect meaningful data, like. Um, I was really looking to show uh, outcome measures, like if you participate in this program, then you should come out and have better self-esteem. But I couldn't measure that, and so I wound up doing a PowerPoint trying to, I had all this data, so I wound up doing a PowerPoint trying to figure out what can I show to people when I'm, um, uh, show, when I'm presenting it that will be interesting. And what I was able to use uh, creative vision, I mean creative data, for was to show the retention rate, like mm -hmm. how many students were participated in, uh, in the program, week one, week two. So now I'm trying to kind of focus looking at, not, now I can, since I can get people engaged or youth engaged in this art program, now I can look at ways to kind of test them in self-esteem or um, depression and things like that. So I was able to use it as a for, for a time, <laughs> it was, but it was helpful, made people really interested in the project more than I could That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, and it's yeah, more important than trying to capture everything that your program does, you find that one thing, and then that can help push it forward. And sometimes it's really simple. Like, that's the other thing I want to drive home. You know, mm -hmm. I know I said it's okay to tell people what you think they already know. Um, I don't know if anyone's read the Malcolm Gladwell, The Tipping Point. Um, he has this great story in there about. Um, this, ex this experiment that they did at a college campus where they showed a bunch of pictures to college students um, of some, thing, some disease that they could get vaccinated for at the health center. And so um, they did like one, one group of students, they just talked about the disease. And then the other group of students, they like showed pictures. And obviously the responses for the group of students that they showed pictures was, you know, much horrible, you know, 98% of them or something said that they were going to go get vaccinated. But then when they actually looked at the, the vaccine center um, reports, they found that really there was no difference in the kids that saw the pictures and then the kids that um, were just talking, talking about it. So then they did the experiment again and put a map on the sheet that showed on campus 
where the health center was to go get vaccinated. Um, and that was literally the only thing they changed. And the um, results were like off the charts as far as the students that actually went and did go get vaccinated from that. And they even said, you know, all these kids probably knew where that health center was, but it just took a picture of a map on the form. Really simple, something that you think is so obvious um, may actually incite that change and that movement that you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, that's I my a, story. <laughs> on a, on a similar, there was a, I don't know if anyone saw that there was a map that went around recently um, that showed that, you know, 50% of the US GDP is produced in these places and it highlighted just a couple of US cities. Um, and a lot of people, you know, shared it all over the place and thought, oh, this is an amazing infographic. And then some other people came up and said, oh, this is nothing. This is just a population map. This is just where 50% of the people in the US live. And like, so it's not really showing what you think it is. But the, the flip side of that is that, yes, we're showing something that people already know, but obviously they hadn't internalized it. This map was still important to get people to realize this one fact, even if it's showing something that, you know, is pretty intuitive when you think about it. I mean, so yeah, it, don't be afraid about kind of driving home your point if that's the if that's the important thing that that's the one thing you want people to get out of your work Yeah, I mean, um, we try to annotate our data, our visualizations whenever, I mean, whenever needed. Like even the, the school's visualization had a, um, a large block of text on the side and it explained how we put it together. And also like specifically within our case that we weren't showing, um, uh, you know, like special ed schools or other schools that fit it, that didn't fit the, the sort of um, analysis we were doing. Um, so that people, you know, if they were looking for, you know, that one school that wasn't in, why it wasn't in. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and that's, that's key to putting context back into your piece. What are they using? No, 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 like before they come into your program, what are they using? Like what do they have experience with now? Yeah. Do they have cell phones? Yeah. Do they have cell phones? Proficient. Mm -hmm. um, Tableau has a really great free program um, it used to just be Windows. I, th I think there's a Mac version now, um, and that is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, um, pretty easy to get into. There's a pretty small learning curve, um, and then yeah, like Google products are normally really good for learning. Like if you can get a spreadsheet on there, you can get a graph from it pretty quickly. Um, uh, if you're doing web visualization, like the data wrapper tool we use is really really easy. You just copy and paste from a spreadsheet, and then it's point and click to get different graphs. Um, you can s visualize those real quickly. How much would you recommend going into, like, just the like, um, I think you can cover the basics really quickly, like, um, I mean, like what we were talking about, like if you have data that changes over time, like maybe use a line graph. If you're trying to show parts of a whole, um, maybe use a pie graph, but don't tell Edward Tufty. Um, <laughs> Um, and then also the key, and then just always use a bar graph, I guess. I don't know. Um, but you can cover kind of those main four, like four or five points really quickly, and then let them experiment from there.
Um, some of the Google Graph stuff does allow you to do that. Um, if you're doing mapping, there's a pro, uh, program called Carto DB mm -hmm. that you can do some animations on. It's limited, like you can, you know, use a certain number of maps before you have to pay for it. Um, but I would try it out and see what you think. Um, I think those, I mean, as far as free ones, those are kind of the main for animations, I think. Uh, does anyone else have any yeah, <laughs> so we're not thinking of? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, we actually we did that on a project on um, gerrymandering in Chicago. We did just that. We um, took a bunch of pictures from Tile Mill and gift them, and then that was it. That was all we did. And that's, yeah, sometimes the simplest thing is the best way to go. Yeah. Like 99% of the time, simplest <laughs> thing is the best way to go. Yeah. Um, so my my degree is in television and print journalism, mm -hmm. and I started out in TV and then went into newspapers. Um, but in the meantime, I got really, really into baseball stats, and uh -huh. that was how I learned how to use databases and visualization. And it was only later that I realized I could do it in my work. <laughs> <laughs> um, my degree is in uh, film theory, specifically audience engagement and uh, social issue film. Um, so I kind of fell into the data part of it. Um, as a way to, I've worked in nonprofit arts for ten year, eight years, and um, as a way to talk about uh, information and uh, and impact. You know, the impact conversation in the film and art world is a really big conversation right now, um, and also the social issue world for arts for nonprofits in general. I was talking to someone at lunch who was like, "Oh, just yesterday, there's a new open source software for measuring social issue impact." Um, which I, I hadn't even heard about yet. So uh, I sort of fell into the data visualization and data storytelling part of it as a way to um, continue having a more progressive conversation around um, how what we're doing does change perceptions. And so we, you know, our main focus is creating stories and creating power, powerful narratives. And then we use data as a way to um, clarify certain points within that. I guess off of that, I would just say that um, a lot of the people who I have met in kind of the the civic data or kind of data hacker sort of space are a lot of people who taught themselves how to do it. So don't be afraid to get into it. Um, use your search engine of choice and just look for the things you want to do. Probably someone has written an open source program for it or has written a tutorial on it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the one thing it will probably take more than anything else is just your time. I mean, I think anyone can kind of learn the learn enough to, to do something really really great in this field you just have to be willing to put in the time to do it and don't be afraid to ask people for help And the meetup session tomorrow, too. Yeah. All right. What time is this on? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Quick question. Yeah. Just about your uh, one module for Ether. Um, are there any, like, specific, like, uh, reference or serials or, like, index data or something that you can go to? Um, well, I guess it's not like a cheat sheet, but if you don't, um, if you haven't gone to Stack Overflow before, that's like the, like if you're starting to do anything technical, that's kind of the Bible where all these questions have already been asked. Mm -hmm. um, when you're thinking of asking a question on a message board, go there first, and someone probably already has. Um, Can you say it again? Uh, Stack, Stack Overflow. overflow. Yeah. Stack Overflow. <laughs> Sorry. All together now. I didn't mean to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but no, it's like as far as like a cheat sheet, like I don't I don't know that I have a specific one. There's a really there's some really good ones for geospatial stuff. Um, one in particular, there's like this you know, nationwide movement type thing. I don't know if I'd call it movement, but a bunch of people are doing this thing called Map Time. Mm -hmm. like And they have uh, meetups in Chicago, too. Yes. You guys know any organizations that fund people who want to better develop their uh, data visualization for marketing and things like that? Um, I don't know about funding. I know um, I've actually taken some of the courses on um, Coursera, mm -hmm. which is a free, and they have yeah. they have a lot of courses around data not necessarily visualization specifically but it, you do get into that kind of stuff um yeah I've, I've liked those can you spell that uh c-o-u-r-s-e-r-a -E -E yeah, yeah. they have all different types of classes right now i'm taking like an innovation and nonprofit class on there so mm -hmm. yeah i've taken some data classes on there i took one on yeah on um gis the geographic information systems My wife took one on the history of food, so there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. It's sort of unrelated to data, but I saw recently that Alina Matthews from the Interrupted Data and Chance and I just wanted to check in if anyone was doing anything for fundraising or getting the word out and stuff like that. She, um, sh so one of the subjects from our film, one of our films that came out in 2011 is, uh, was recently diagnosed. Um, and we, so she has her own fundraising campaign that we have helped promote. Um, and then we are talking with her about her options and supporting her through that, yes. And also just to reiterate, you know, you don't have to necessarily make um, the most advanced piece of data visualization that's possible. Like, you know, we are a very small nonprofit with a very small staff and very small budget, and we do everything in-house, and we just use what we can. And it works, and it works well a lot of the time. You don't always necessarily have to spend thousands of dollars to create um, a, an amazing PDF. You can just do one in-house if, if you have a little bit of time and some go-getter employees. Yeah, I would say, I mean, Public Radio, we are a nonprofit as mm -hmm. well. And um, I, 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 I mean, everything in that project was free. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, the main thing is just taking the time, and that's kind of the main thing, to, to learn the tools and then learn how to use them, you know, correctly. Andy, how much more time do we have? Okay. <laughs> um, well, we, I guess if we wanted to, if we, we could end early, if people have wanted to come up and ask questions, we could do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've had a video program out of our uh, kids' program for uh, a long time, okay. and uh, we're te teaching kids to tell the story and, and to tell the story in a way that they're asking for uh, it pretty often. Yeah. Uh, but I've also been doing maps uh, through the Twitter connection and, and trying to do different things to try to uh, get people to look at all the different places and all the different programs, not just one or two. Uh -huh. So I've created some of this stuff. Is eight. 
creating a message is trying to be getting them out. Right. No, but that's right. a different piece. Right. Um, one of the things that, uh, so I put yeah. some, some models of trying to get your athletes to be the messenger, uh -huh. uh, or other celebrities to be the messenger, uh -huh. 